and one of those primarily guilty of making you hear what I'm saying. The joke is this. A man went to a ranch for a holiday. He wanted a horse. So the man said, all the horses are out. You slept late. But I have a horse, but he's a funny kind of a fellow. He knows only two things. If you say, oi, he starts walking. If you say, oi, oi, he starts cantering. If you say, oi, 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 he starts galloping. And the only way to make him stop is to say, shalom. <laughs> he says, that, that, that's simple enough. Oi, 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 and shalom. Okay, I've got it. So the man climbed the horse, said, oi, turned him around, started walking, oi, oi, started galloping, then oi, 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 and started cantering and then galloping. And he really was enjoying himself. Then suddenly he realized that the horse was galloping towards a precipice. There's nothing there. The horse was galloping fast towards the precipice. And he didn't remember the word to make him stop. <laughs> and the horse was galloping. Suddenly the, he remembered and said, Shalom. He said. So the horse stopped. And he stopped right on the brink of the precipice. So the man looked down the precipice. <laughs> looked down the precipice. And he says, Oi. <laughs> Next time Ed calls, I'll tell him his joke was a great success at the seminar. <laughs> I'm sure he'll be pleased. This, this one says, how does family life look like when one is only realizing what is happening? Do I take part on the problems of the children or the family members? How do I take part on those problems? I think it's really a valid question. But the question is based on the misunderstanding that once the understanding, the final understanding happens, the ego, the me, the body-mind organism becomes a sort of vegetable. Therefore, the question is, what do I do? And that really is the problem of the ego. When the ego starts, on this journey, the spiritual journey, that is really the problem of the ego. Because the ego, from the moment he's told it, the ego must die. The ego must die. And deep down, while the ego realizes that the understanding would mean ultimate peace, the ego still doesn't want to die. So the problems you find in your spiritual search is basically this resistance of the ego who does not want to die. So my suggestion is, has always been you are the ego. You cannot kill the ego. Whatever the ego is, take him along with you. 
you cannot do without the ego. Therefore, my, my point always has been, please understand what the ego is. And it's astonishing what amount of misconception there is about the ego. I often start my talk in Bombay in the morning on this. So I said, usually the visitor uses the word ego. So I said, what do you understand by the word ego? And he says, identification as a separate entity which creates separation between me and the others. So I said, that's not quite it. If it were merely the question of identification with a body-mind organism and a name as a separate entity, that same identification has to continue even after the understanding has happened. Because the sage has to continue to live for the rest of his span of life, allotted span of life. Ramana Maharshi lived for 50 years after his self-realization. And I, I often have to say the same thing. And if during his lifetime Ramana Maharshi was called by name, or any sage is called by name, he responds. So the fact that a sage responds to his name being called obviously means there is identification with a name and form as a separate entity. It is only that name addressed to that body-mind organism, separate from all other body-mind organisms, which makes the sage respond. So the ego, the core of the ego, is not mere identification, but identification with a form as the doer. So the sense of doership is the core of the ego. So what the total understanding destroys is this sense of personal doership. So the total understanding, according to my concept, self-realization or enlightenment, simply means that total, deepest possible, total, unconditional acceptance that in this life, no one is a doer. Again, I repeat the Buddha's words. Events happen, deeds are done, there is no individual doer thereof. It's as really as simple as that. The understanding simply means this. So if there is an understanding, total understanding, that there is no individual doer, then truly there is no real problem. But the mind still exists in the form of an ego. Not very dangerous, but it's still there, the mind. Mostly it is a working mind. So the mind says, therefore, as in this, the in, in, when the understanding is there, in such circumstances, what do I do? So to that question, which remains, my answer is extraordinarily simple. He, the answer is, even with the understanding there that you are not the doer, the action has to be done by an apparent doer. So the apparent doer, the question, what do I do about the children? I have the understanding. Or how does the sage live in a family life with the children? The answer is, again, repeatedly, do whatever you think you should do. So you have the children and you have the problems with the children. So the answer is, do whatever you think you should do with the children. If you think you should give them advice, as naturally every parent will want to, then 
you can all you can do is to give that child that advice which you at that moment want to give with the understanding that you are not the doer try it not just mentally but try it at any moment something needs to be done some advice to be given to the child at the moment you will notice that the words have come out at the moment the child will not give you the chance to think an answer to think of an answer to think how to word that answer the child being a child will compel you to do something so even that what do i do really doesn't mean anything the doing will happen the qu- answer you give the advice you give to the child at that moment will happen it is later that the thinking mind the ego wonders have i given the child the right advice what may what will happen to my child if that advice is wrong that's where the problem arises so the understanding there is the advice that you have given if it has been given the deed is done and you could not have given at that moment at that place any other advice that is the understanding the advice has been given the whatever words have been used have been used so it was god's will that you give the child the advice that has been given at that moment only question is what will happen to the child the answer again is obvious whatever happens to the child then until his life goes on and the child has a child everything happens according to god's will and it is the destiny of everyone that cannot be changed by anyone by any power on earth so the what is often forgotten is that the child has its own destiny and the parent cannot control it that is the main point to understand about children according to my concept the child has his own destiny that doesn't prevent you from giving the advice that you think is necessary at that moment what happens then is truly totally out of your control so why bother about it you do what you think you should do and what happens to the child is its own destiny the advice that you give a child will usually be the same for different children and yet you find each child has his own life has his own destiny so what do i do with a child need really need not be a problem deal with the child at the moment as you think fit and what happens to the child depends on the destiny of the child and the destiny of a child destiny of any body according to my concept is the will of god for that particular body mind organism again according to my concept stamped at the moment of conception if at the moment of conception the destiny of that conception is not to be born at all then that conception will be aborted willingly or unwillingly if it is the destiny of that conception to be born the baby will be born and the destiny of that baby the span of life 
that that body mind organism will have and what happens to that body mind organism during that entire span of life every single moment according to my concept is determined so if the if a baby is born in, in not too happy circumstances, to a poor family or one, one parent family, then the destiny could be vastly different. The destiny of one would be to continue in that poverty and have a miserable life. Or it may be the destiny of that child to be adopted by someone in a wealthy country, brought about, brought up well. There's a friend of mine in New Jersey, a couple. They didn't want to, I think it was the, 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 the husband already had a child, grown up child, with, with the first wife. But the second wife wanted children and the, the husband was resisting it. They were not married. They had a relationship for 12 years. They were not married. Then what happened was, he, he was my host in New Jersey during the talks there. Ray Napolitano and his wife, Marsha. During the, the very first, at the end of this session, at the end of the seminar, the last talk, I wanted to thank them for taking such good care of me. So I said, the words just came out. I said, Ray and his wife, Marsha, for just a split second, I stopped. Just for a split second. I knew they were not married. But I, I said, Ray and his wife, Marsha. And I thanked them. Then the same night, Ray asks Marsha, Marsha, Ramesh said Ray and his wife, shall we get married? <laughs> and they did get married. And then Ray understood Marsha's need for children. But they had two abortions. And then the doctor advised them not to have any more children. So they decided to adopt a child. So they adopted a child, a baby girl. And I had no idea until they told me how difficult it is for an American couple to adopt a child. It's not from Cambodia. Anyway, one of the South American countries. Hmm? Yes, as I said. But ultimately, they did have that girl, a lovely child. And what is more, the mother wrote to them two years later and said, look, I'm going to have another baby. Do you want to adopt it? <laughs> and they talked to each other and promptly sent a cable, yes, we want to adopt it. So what I mean is, just imagine, thousands of miles away, two babies. You can imagine what their future would have been in the place where they were born, to the mother that they were born. And it so happened that their destiny to have taken them to the States, to be looked after like princesses. And Ray and Marsha sent us a photograph of the two children, lovely children, two lovely girls. So whenever I think of the destiny, I often think of this. So whatever is going to happen to your child has already been decided. But that does not prevent you. In fact, it cannot prevent you from saying and doing things which, in your, which you honestly think are in the interest of the children.
So do it. You want to say something, say it. But the destiny of the child is already decided. And if that is understood, then probably if that understanding comes in handy, every time you want to say something or do something for the children, you will find it easier. And what the child remembers out of the load of advice the parent gives, nobody can remember anything. Heiner tells me, his wife, his, his father, used to be every day, and he still remembers the way he No, this must be done, that must be done. And he says, out of the thousands of advice he gave me, he says, I follow only one advice which I rather like myself, which is, he said, do it now. <laughs> <laughs> and the way he says it, you know, in German, the way, do it now. <laughs> <laughs> so there again, the simplicity, if the understanding is that you cannot change your child's destiny, but you are a parent, and the parental, I wouldn't call it duty, the parental instinct is to do what the parent thinks is best for the child. So do it, whether it is advice or something to do. So what I'm saying is, Parents make a problem of something which is not a problem. So if this is understood, there is no problem. Do whatever you think you should do in the interest of your own children. You are not going to tell them to do something which, is, which you think is not right. What they do is their destiny. The next one, is the manifestation of everything occurring like the flow of a river or are all manifestations already performed in a frozen state of space-time? I repeat, is the manifestation of everything occurring like the flow of a river or are all manifestations already performed in a frozen state of space-time? The answer is, life is like a movie. The movie is already done. In the movie, what is frozen is particular items. In the film, the each stage, each, each, that is frozen. But what happens in temporal duration, I like the word, all it means is time. <laughs> in time, the various bits get, because you, you see the whole space is quickly done, but the spaces are already there. So nothing changes, whether life is frozen or flows like a river. It really makes no difference. Even the flow of the river is part of the picture, is part of the movie. So it really doesn't matter whether the picture is frozen or, or it's like an aquarium. The aquarium is there. Do the fish? Yes. The fish. <laughs> but <laughs> how far can they go? <laughs> if past, present, and future is performed in the source, then what is time? 
if past, present and future is performed in the source, then what is time? The same metaphor of a movie. The movie goes on. So the source in which life happens, the like the movie goes on. And we attach too much importance to the movie. The difference between a sage watching a movie, this movie of life, and an ordinary man watching the movie of life, participating in it as one of the characters, the difference is again an extremely simple one. The ordinary man participates in this movie of life as if the movie was all there is. And the movie means everything. It's even forgotten that the movie has been going on for some time. And the movie will go on for some time. What is important to us at the moment just didn't exist a hundred years ago. And what really makes it difficult for us to accept something, 100 years later, nobody, no one, not even your grandchildren will remember it. So the difference between the sage and the ordinary man is the sage accepts this. Sage knows this. So the sage participates in this movie of life, participating in it according to the own sensitivity in that body-mind organism. Something sad happens, tears may come into his eyes. Something amusing happens, the sage laughs. Compassion arises, anger arises. The sage participates in life exactly like an ordinary man. The big, big difference is that while the ordinary man forgets that there would be no movie in the absence of the screen of consciousness, the sage is never unaware that this is only a movie. What is real and permanent is the screen, the screen of consciousness, the source. So the movie takes place on the screen of the source. Does a sage has insight into the totality of past, present and future? <laughs> the whole point is, the sage doesn't care to know the past, <laughs> present and future. <laughs> it's, only the, it's only the ordinary man who is concerned so much with what is going to happen in future. But once this understanding happens, even the future is there. And the understanding, as I mentioned the other day, this motto of the count, this too will pass. If this understanding includes this very thoroughly, this too will pass. What we call at the moment, if pain or pleasure, this too will pass. The understanding doesn't leave any scope for wanting to know what is going to come in future. Except, of course, you call the, the airline and say, is my plane on time? <laughs> for that you want to know. But otherwise, it doesn't matter. Another one, sometimes I'm able to transfer, sometimes I'm able to transfer the doing from myself and others onto God. So I become comfortable with myself and others. But then I'm uncomfortable with God. <laughs> Thank you.
even as a child, this was happening. When I first learned that God was responsible for everything. So, all the anger, hatred, etc. have now been transferred to God. Can I help the person with this? <laughs> the answer is really, if it is totally accepted that nothing happens unless it is the will of God, then the individual me is not concerned with what happened. So the real question here is, does God know fair and unfair? Does God have a basis on which he has created this life? So the real basis of the question is, how can I know that what God is doing is right or wrong? <laughs> How do I know that whatever God is doing, does he really know what he is doing? <laughs> More often than not, I feel that God, what God is doing is not right. I could have done a much better job. That is where the whole question comes in. And the answer repeatedly has to be the same. Who wants to know, as Ramana Maharshi said? Find out who wants to know. And the who who wants to know is basically, fundamentally, essentially, is nothing more than a created object. How can a created object know the basis on which the creator's subject functions. How can a figure painted in a picture know why the painter has painted the picture? How can a created human statuette ever possibly know why the sculptor has created the statuette at all and why he has created the statuette so ugly? <laughs> And, and this probably would have been the question from many creations of Epstein. There was a sculptor called Epstein many years ago. And the story is told that the Indian Nobel Prize laureate, a poet, painter, a genius, a man called Rabindranath Tagore, so the story is told, or in fact, I think it's in one of Epstein's biography, autobiography that I remember reading. So Epstein says, Rabindranath Tagore heard of me. He came to his studio and he went around it and he went through it very quickly. Obviously, he couldn't stand the ugliness. Rabindranath Tagore, with his classical painting of beauty and, and wonderful calm and harmony, he, he was that kind of a person. So his idea of beauty didn't tally with Epstein's idea of beauty. So Epstein says, <laughs> he, they bid goodbye and he was going out. So Epstein says, I saw Rabindranath Tagore going down the same. His last gesture was, <laughs> this is beauty, this is art. <laughs> oh God, what the... <laughs> One day, our then six-year-old son said to his father, Dad, I discovered how God talks to us. 
So his father asked, with great curiosity and genuine interest, how does he do it? And the child, his clear and confident answer was, he makes you say something, and this is how he talks to you. He makes you say something, and this is how he talks to you. Obviously, the child meant, whatever I say, God has made me say it. Could you please talk about living with children? What do you teach them and what do they teach us? What we teach them, I've already said. But it's interesting, the intuitive understanding of the children. And the child truly does not understand any question asked like this. He gives an answer. Now, a famous actor, he told me, he and his wife, they told me, they have a son. Both are interested in, in spiritual teaching. Both meditate, especially the father. He meditates regularly. And when he sits, the child also sits. And uh, the father told me, he said, he sits for quite some time. Then after a while, he gets up and goes away. When I finish, he's gone. But he does sit in meditation. So a friend asked him, he said, when Dennis sits for his meditation, I'm told you also sit. He said, yes. And then the question was, how do you meditate? How do you meditate? And the answer came from the child. He's eight now, so he must have been five or six then. And the answer was, I take myself within. I take myself within and thank God for everything. I take myself within and thank God for everything. That was his meditation. And when he took himself within, maybe he remained within for quite some time. Another the intuitive understanding of the children. The lady who told me, she's dead now, but one of the, one of the uh, functions in seminars in South India, she and her husband both used to work and they had four children. So the, the eldest child, I think his name was Pierre, but I wouldn't swear to it. So, and they had to employ a woman to take care of the children and do the housework. So she would come in the morning just before the, the parents left for work, she would take care of the children and leave when, they, when the mother came back. One evening when the mother came back, the, the nurse told her, told the mother, Madam, do you know what Pierre told me this morning or this afternoon? Pierre said, we are all dead and we'll wake up or we are all, yes, we'll wake up when we are dead. We are, wait a minute, I think God, we are all dreaming. We are all dreaming and we'll wake up when we are dead. We are all dreaming and we'll wake up when we are dead. The mother said, must be some misunderstanding with the nurse. <laughs> so, when she gave the child his bath and was drying him, she said, what did you tell, forget the name, what did you tell the nurse today? She said, oh, I told her a lot of things. 
but something about God? Oh, she said, oh yes, I told, told her, we are all dreaming and we'll wake up when we are dead. No mistake, very clear. So she said, who told you that? And this mother, Eva Maria was her name. Eva Maria tells me, Ramesh, you should have seen the expression of pity on <laughs> Pierre's face when I asked that question. The child, he said, the question was, who told you that? And the mother said, you should have seen the pity on the child's face for me who had asked that question. <laughs> then he said, after a moment, he said, who told me that? God told me that. And his expression then was, now are you satisfied? So, the, the intuition of the child is something very deep. Once what happened was, someone known to the family died. And at home, my son and his wife and my wife, they were talking about this event of someone dying. Their girl, I think not more than three or four years old, was present. Extremely curious, intelligent child. So she wanted to know about death. My son, with a bit of a perfectionist, would have given some other answer, which would have been acceptable to a child. But he said, no, she must know. So he gave her a beautiful lecture on life and death, life and living, for about three minutes, five minutes. The child listened very attentively because she's a curious, she wants to know. She listened to him very at attentively. And then she said, I'm never going to die. And she went to play. Life and death, he said. I am never going to die. Why should I bother about death? He said. <laughs> That's why truly there is no liver of life and no dyer of death. Life and death are just two events which happen in the flow of life. And the same child Anyway, I forget it. <laughs> but that was really, a, I don't remember it at the moment. Ah, yes. It's, in, <laughs> it's interesting. You see, the, the, the same child, overburdened with energy, she was at that time, again, not more than three years old. So one evening, Akshata is the name of the child and Gita is the mother, my daughter-in-law. One evening, Gita told the child, look Akshata, I'm absolutely fagged out. You have tired me out. And she listened. She agreed. So she said, would you do one thing for me? He said, certainly, mommy, certainly. So she said, I'll give you a bath now. After I give you the bath, will you please go to your room, sit for five minutes, and pray to God that you do not tire me out so much. Pray to God that he will make you a good girl. Sit for five minutes and pray to God that he will make you a good girl. She promised ardently. And she didn't forget. 
After she had her bath, she went into the room, sat for five, what she thought was five minutes, <laughs> and came out. You see, and she was about to go out to play. The mother stopped her, and he says, "Akshita, did you pray to God?" Of course, mother. You saw me sit there. Of course, I prayed to God. Very hard. <laughs> then the next day, same thing happens. So in the evening, Gita says, "Akshita, I thought you had prayed to God." Mother, I did pray very hard. And if he hasn't made me a good girl, either he can do nothing about it. Or he wants me to be as I am, three-year-old child. Believe me. Either he can do nothing about it, or he wants me to be as I am. And then he went to play. And Gita said, "I stood there with tears in my eyes with this answer." My question is, what is your understanding of a creator? What is the difference between an enlightened human being and the creator? Since everything is consciousness, does a creator exist in duality? If an enlightened man is one with the creator, he should know the will of the creator or not. What has happened here is that the question, there is a misunderstanding that the creator is himself an entity creating other entities. But that is not my idea of the creator. The creator is the source, one without a second. Out of the source has come this manifestation, has emerged this manifestation, and there is a lovely metaphor in, in one Hindu text called Bhagavatam. It gives a lovely metaphor. The metaphor is, he said, the manifestation emerges from the source. The manifestation is created by the source, exactly like a spider creates a web without using any material outside of itself. The source is all there is, one without a second. The source didn't have any material outside of himself to create this manifestation. So the manifestation is exactly what the source is, and the spider creates the web not out of material outside of himself, but from his own saliva. So the spider creates the web, and the when when the web is no longer necessary, it takes the web back inside. So the manifestation emerges from the source. Out of a tremendous burst of energy, which is called the Big Bang, and when the unimaginable intensity of that energy expands itself some time, millions and millions of years later, then what is left goes back into the source. Therefore, there is no question of a created thing wanting to know how the creator works. Again, the same thing. A created thing has e is the source. So, therefore, the question is: Can a created thing know exactly what 
the creator is doing. But the difference is what has come out of the source cannot be anything other than the source. But what has emerged from the source is only an appearance. But that appearance does not have an existence of its own. Its existence depends entirely on the energy generated by the source. So the whole question is based on the fact, on the, on the belief that the source is one and the manifested is the other. Then there will be two. Whereas the source and the manifestation are not two. In the words of the Buddha, the samsara and nirvana are not two. They cannot be two because the source is only one. Whether it is called consciousness or source or God or energy. Sorry? Yes, do. Oh, I should have, I, should, I, was, I meant to say that, but I forgot. Between these questions that I'm reading, if you have any question, by all means ask. I meant to say that. Thank you for so, it. The question is now, has this source at any time, any time, how far ago in the future, ever been totally, absolutely empty of manifestation? That there was not one particle of manifestation? I'm sorry, I, 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 I didn't get the question. Yes, yes. You see, what happens is the source is all there is, and the manifestation is in duality. Anything in the manifestation is based on duality. The source is unicity, and the duality has emerged from the unicity. So what happens here, as I just mentioned, the impersonal the source creates manifestation. Another metaphor is, which the scientist prefers, the impersonal potential energy activizes itself into this manifestation. The potential energy activizes itself into this manifestation. Why? Because it is the nature of the potential to activize itself sometime. Otherwise, it wouldn't be potential. It would be dead matter. So it is the nature of the potential to activize itself sometime. And the activization happens. And when the, the intense energy which has caused this activization expends itself sometime, millions and millions of years, then the manifestation goes back into the activization goes back into the potential. What is activized goes back into the potential until the potential again activizes itself. But the space and time exist only in the activization. In the potential, there is no space time. So we cannot ask after how many years will the potential activize itself again? But then this potential itself, you compared it with the spider. The potential is the spider, yes, from that that yes, but that with, metaphor, yes. With my understanding, a spider is still something material. So <laughs> that you see that you are quite right. That is the biggest problem with using any illustration. That is the basic fundamental problem with giving any illustration. But the intellect finds it difficult to understand a point without an illustration. So illustrations have to be used, but with the understanding that any illustration will be based on objects. And in the original, there are no objects. You see? 
So the spider and the web are all objects. The spider and the web are both objects. Whereas the source and the manifestation, only the manifestation is an object. The source is not an object. You see? That is the fundamental difficulty of any any illustration. I still cannot understand it. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yes. <laughs> Please. Is it possible to say that uh, the source is knowing itself? Like, like in the Sufi tradition is said, um, I was a hidden treasure and created the world because yeah. I uh, wanted to be found. Yeah. The, the point is, the source is consciousness at rest. Consciousness at rest, there is no need to know itself. And whatever is said about the source or consciousness is a concept. That is what must always remain. So the concept is that consciousness, not aware of itself, consciousness at rest, not aware of itself, becomes aware of itself when the manifestation happens. You see? So the I am that is talked about, I am, the impersonal awareness of being, I am, is essentially involved with the manifestation and phenomenality. The noumenon is consciousness not aware of itself. In phenomenality, there is the awareness of I am. So the awareness of I am, the in-person, is only in phenomenality. In nominality, in the noumenon, there's no need. So that's why it said, I created the, the world because I want to be found. Because in that picture, I mean, if there happens impersonal awareness in a human being, then, then it's kind of that God knows himself as I am. That is correct. That is correct. God knows himself only in manifestation as I am. I exist. Until then, he was unaware of itself. You see? Thank you. No, you're most welcome. Ah, after a long time. Is there rebirth? <laughs> One of the things I really enjoyed most, <laughs> really enjoyed, was the report. I repeat, it was a report in the newspaper that when Dalai Lama visited the United States, if you can find out on the internet exactly when it was, it would be a big help. <laughs> the Dalai Lama visited the United States. But before that, let me, Heiner wanted to interview the Dalai Lama. So Heiner talked to someone in the office, called him, and he said, I want to, for, a, for a, an interview in a magazine. So the secretary says, well, such and such a time he's available. The time didn't suit Heiner, so Heiner didn't go. But on the telephone, Heiner was given the instruction, suggestion. When you come for the interview, don't ask the Dalai Lama whether he believes in rebirth. <laughs> and he was further told, it will be like asking Pope if he is a Roman Catholic. <laughs> so don't ask, the, don't ask the Dalai Lama whether he believes in rebirth. So when he went to the stage, obviously someone said, is there rebirth? And I loved Dalai Lama's answer. I really loved it, as it is reported. He said, of course there is rebirth. Then he gave his big booming laugh <laughs> and said, but there is nothing personal in it. 
I really love it. <laughs> Nothing personal. <laughs> so the basis of rebirth is doing personal doership. The whole point about rebirth is personal doership. So if you accept that there is a personal doer responsible for his karma, then there is rebirth. But if the understanding is that no karma or action is any individual's karma, then the whole theory of rebirth collapses. New births, yes, they have been going on for years, millions of years. Birth and death of, a, of an object. But if we accept that the object cannot possibly do anything, all the doing can be brought about through an object by the energy which functions, then there is poss no possibility of any rebirth of anyone because there is no one to do anything. Who is, who is to be reborn? That is the whole point. Once it is accepted that no one does anything, the theory of re then wh why did the theory come up? I would say for socio-economic reasons, to tell every human being, be a good boy or be a good girl, or you will suffer in your next life. What have I done to, de to deserve this very Sad life. You did bad things in your previous life. So the whoever has to give the explanation is satisfied. It's only for practical purposes. Now, this reminds me of a story. There was a couple who were intensely in love with each other and they made, they made a pact. When one of us died, the other would go to a medium and ask to talk. There is, they were of the belief, rebirth, life after death, that kind of a thing. So they made a pact. Then he died first. So she went to a medium and said, I want to contact my husband. So he, he did some tricks. And he, now, now you are in touch with your husband. You can talk to him. So she said, Alan, are you, are you all right? He said, I'm in wonderful. Are you, are you happy? I said, happier than I've ever been in my life. Really? <laughs> so he said, what's happening? Sex in the morning, sex in the afternoon, <laughs> sex in the evening. So he said, where are you? <laughs> so he said, I'm a jackrabbit in Arizona. <laughs> so that's rebirth. <laughs> This one says, when my heart is overflowing with gratitude and love, it feels like a prayer. But now that I don't feel so much like a me, separate from God, what to do? I would like to give thanks for blessings, food, love, etc. But how? And to whom? Is there justification? for saying grace over meals. Please help me understand. Well, the answer is 
that in a true prayer there is no one sending a prayer. A prayer happens. The usual cause of prayer, the genuine prayer, is gratitude. As the as Dennis's child said, I take myself within and thank God for everything. Even the child must realize that he is an extremely lucky child, born to wealthy parents, full of love extended to him. He sees others not so fortunate. So he says, I take myself within and thank God for everything. That's in meditation. So when a prayer happens, the pray so long as there is a me thinking he is praying to God, then this problem arises. Now that I know that I really don't do anything, now that I know that I really am not doing anything, everything happens, then how do I pray? Why do I have to say grace? If there is the true acceptance that he is not the doer, if the sense of doership is gone, then the feeling I am saying the grace would never be there. So the sense of doership has not really gone. That's why the question, do I have to say grace? Do I have to say grace when I know that I'm not the doer? You see the question? Do I have to say grace when I know that I'm not the doer? Who is to say grace when you have understood that there is no doer? That is the essential part of it. But the more practical part of it is, if I truly understand that whatever happens is God's will, do I have to say prayers? Do I have to say anything? In other words, do I have to acknowledge God? That is the real point. If I know that there is no individual doing anything, everything happens because of God, but there is still this feeling of a me, not as a doer, but continues, as identification with a body-mind organism. <coughs> Ramana Maharshi's lovely simile, he said, the sage's ego is like the remnants of a burnt rope. The sage's ego is like the remnants of a burnt rope. The shape is there, but it's useless. You can't tie anybody with it. So the sage's ego is mere identification. So the sense of doing anything doesn't arise. So the real question is, I have been saying grace. Do I need to say grace? That is the question. What is the One moment. Let me finish, please. So the real question is, I have been saying grace. But since now I understand that I am not the doer, can I stop saying grace? That is the question. Can I stop doing grace? But what is not understood is that the doing and the not doing, stopping means not doing, is the same doer. So the question, should I stop doing, is that of a doer who thinks he's still the doer. The answer, therefore, is let the saying of the grace continue to happen so long as it continues to happen. If for some reason saying of the grace stops, then don't think, blame yourself for stopping the grace, stopping the saying of the grace. 
So the doing of it and not doing of it is still the doing. So many years ago, with me there has been an intuitive acceptance of non-doership. There is an instinctive understanding that all that exists is the source. It's always been there. Therefore, I wasn't very keen on doing the regular routine spiritual practices which a Hindu Brahmin was supposed to do. My mother didn't like it. She felt terribly hurt. So this I had forgotten. But she reminded me one day. She said, when I was quite young, so she asked me, what do you want? And she says, the answer she got from me was that I want that which existed 10,000 years ago, which exists now, and will exist 10,000 years hence. And I'm not going to like it. So why should I do these practices? Then she and I made a pact. There was a stotra, recitation. The Hindu call it stotra, the Buddhist call it sutra. Same thing. So the stotra was called Rama Raksha Stotra. She had given me up for lost. So she at least, as a mother, she wanted protection for me as a child. So there was this stotra called Rama Raksha Stotra, which is quite long. Saying by heart, it takes about 10 minutes. So we made a pact. Whatever else I may or may not do, I shall not stop saying the Ramaraksha Stotra. So I still have my bath or shower and I still repeat the Ramaraksha Stotra. Who is there to stop it? I say, it goes on, it goes on. So the doing and the not doing is still by the same doer. So if something stops, it stops. Ah, does someone who feels encouraged to talk about Advaita in public need a permission from an enlightened master? You said you got permission from Nisargadatta. Vain got permission from you. Does anyone need? You see, people sometimes ask me whether I can recognize someone who has got enlightenment. So I said that is a bit difficult. But I can recognize when someone has not got in mind. <laughs> that is much easier. The explanation is this. If someone wants to be a guru, he is not enlightened. There has been no enlightenment. If someone wants the world to know that he is enlightened, Enlightenment has not happened. You see? So, someone, Maharaj's answer was very good. Sometimes, same question was to Maharaj. Maharaj, when I go back, people will ask me about the teaching. Shall I talk? And Maharaj would say, no. Don't talk. But he would add. But if the talking happens, don't try to stop it. <laughs> if the talking happens, don't try to stop it. But in that case, there will be no one wanting to talk. And if the talking happens, it means somebody, some people come to you. 
and how do people come to you because god has sent them so if people come to you wanting you to talk about this i would ask them how do you happen to come here then something happened which has brought them here so the same answer if you want to talk don't talk but if talking happens let it happen that's the answer does one need an external guru to get free if there is a need for a guru the source will provide the guru for the one who needs a guru i don't honestly think that you should go about actively searching for a guru because the next question will be how do i know that he is a genuine guru how do i know that that guru is for me so my total conviction is that if a guru is needed for a disciple then the source will bring them together yes now <laughs> this is an interesting one you say decide whatever you want when it actually happens it's god's will what if it does not happen <laughs> then there is an explanation he says i ask this because i experience in my daily life that some possible lines of action seem to in inverted commas carry energy some possible lines of action seem to carry energy and if i follow that line of action i can almost be sure that it realizes itself i like to play with that it's like a loving communication with soul would you say that i'm deluded to think that some lines of action feel more energy filled than others my answer is i am inclined she says would you say that i'm deluded to think my answer is i am inclined to think that some lines of action feel more energy filled i say some lines of action feel more acceptable but if you feel they are more acceptable nothing stops you from doing what you like that's what it comes to do what you like what she says is some lines of action seem more acceptable all right do them can one understand how manifestation came into being by means of the intellect or is the intellect what keeps this understanding away like with the question who am i any question keeps the understanding away but if the questions have to happen they happen because it is god's way and the destiny of that body mind organism is to keep asking questions ah here's a good one the you what about responsibility it's a valid question it's a valid question what about responsibility so the individual sense of volition or doership this is the main problem 
being told that nothing is my action gives me a tremendous sense of freedom. But the question arises, even if I truly accept that I am not the doer, in life, every moment, I have to make a decision to do something or not to do something. It's a valid problem. The answer is, what is meant by the word responsibility? There are two things. One, should I or should I not act responsibly if I understand that I am not the doer? In other words, if I understand truly as I am not the doer, why should I act responsibly? The extreme question for this is, if I am not responsible for actions happening through me, what is to prevent me from taking a machine gun, going out and killing 20 people? So when any problem arises, I like to take it to the extreme so that anything earlier has already been answered. <laughs> so the extreme point is, if I don't have the responsibility, all action is God's action. What is to prevent me from taking a machine gun, going out and killing 20 people? My answer is that even if you have given a total written immunity, if you are an American by the American president as executive action, even then you will not be able to do it. Even if you have given the total pardon for doing such an action, even if you know that you are not the doer, you will not be able to do it. Why? Because only a body-mind organism, a psychopathic body-mind organism, programmed to do a thing like this, only such a body-mind organism will do it. No one else will do it. No one else will be able to do it. Similarly, I say, if a law is passed, let's say in some backward country, giving total immunity to the husband to beat his wife, how many husbands will start beating their wives because there is a pardon? Those who have been beating their wives will continue to do it because they are programmed to do it. But because he is not held responsible, is someone going to start beating his wife? So this question is futile. A body-mind organism, an action will happen through a body-mind organism strictly according to the way it is programmed. And taking a machine gun and going out and killing 20 people is not possible to happen. Only a psychopathic organism will be able to do it. So that is one part of it. The other is responsibility associated with consequences. What does one really mean by responsibility? Consequences. So, if I am not responsible for something, it is allied to the other one. If I am not responsible for, and something happens which is against the law or the society's rule, if I am not the doer, why should I be punished? That is the core of the problem of responsibility, consequences. If something happens which I may or may not have wanted to do, but the understanding is that if it happens, 
it was God's will and not my doing. But if the doing that happens, the society and the law will still consider it my doing. And if the action is considered bad, I shall be punished. Why should I be punished for something which I did not do? Why should I be punished for what God has brought about? Again, a valid question. But the misunderstanding there is this. I have not done anything. Means what has happened is God's will. What has happened is God's will. But the understanding has to be extended to the fact that an, that a, an action happens, it is God's will. The consequences of that action are also God's will. The action and the consequences go together as God's will. So if you accept that the action is God's will, the consequences of that action, good, bad or indifferent, are still God's will. And the, the basis of this question is consequences on me. Why should I be punished? So that question, you are not being punished because you are not the doer. That body-mind organism whose destiny it was for that action to happen may be punished or rewarded again according to its own destiny or the will of God. So the action and the consequences go together. But the more important point I would bring out is one thinks of consequences as they may or may not affect himself. But the fact is in modern world with such an interrelationship consequences of anyone's action will not be limited to that particular person or that body-mind organism through which that action is done. Number of others will be concerned. One man authorized to declare war declares war. But the consequences affect not only that person who made that decision, but entire people. So when we talk of responsibility and consequences, the consequences may not affect only the person through whom that action happened, but many others. And therefore, it is the will of God. If it is the will of God that an action happens to a particular body-mind organ, which is going to affect a number of other people, if it is God's will, then that action through that body-mind organism at that time in that place is bound to happen. Consequences are also God's will. An action is God's will. The consequences, whoever is affected, are also God's will. I have the luck that my work as a painter fulfills my life. I'm even addicted to my work. All that which keeps me away from my painting in day life activities creates tension, stress and unhappiness. I know that it is an egocentric behavior, but it seems that I can't avoid that tension and stress in me. Please advise. The answer is, conceptually, my concept, I divide the mind. It's a concept between the working mind and the thinking mind. The working mind is in action when a, some particular job is being done total attention to the work that is being done is done 
by the conceptual working mind. The working mind is not concerned with the consequences. The working mind is only concerned with the job at hand. It is the thinking mind which thinks of the consequences in future and interrupts the working mind. But when the working mind is fully in operation and the thinking mind does not intervene, then there is peace. So the thinking mind is the ego with a sense of personal doership. When the working mind is working on a job, there was never a feeling that I and doing that job. And that is seen in many. There is a famous dancer. I keep forgetting the Nureyev or someone else. Nijinsky, who is who is supposed to have said, I dance best when I'm not there. Same thing everywhere. Many years ago, I remember watching a tennis match between John Ball and John McEnroe many years ago on Wimbledon. Both were playing. You could see that no one was playing anybody. Tennis was happening. Rallies were long. And I mentioned this in 1987 in Hollywood. And one of them, Abe Levitsky, his name was, he stood up and said, Ramesh, I remember that match. She said, I couldn't bear it. So he said, when the, when the rally started, I went to the kitchen, made a cup of tea, coffee, and came back. And the rally was still going on. It was unbearable. So at that time, it was so clear, no one was playing tennis. Tennis was being played. That is the working mind. So the working mind is not concerned with the consequences. It is the thinking mind. And some years ago, there used to be a cartoon called Mutt and Jeff in the States. I think it's not there now. Mutt and Jeff. And there was one cartoon where Mutt, the tall one, and Jeff was the short one. Mutt was driving the car. He was going up the slope. And his accelerator was down and in the cartoon. And he was body language, making it go up. Finally, they reached the top. And Mutt heaves a high sigh of relief. And he says, Jeff, I'm glad we are up here. Because if we were not, we would have slid right down to the bottom. And Jeff says, oh no, Mutt, while you were driving, I had the handbrake fully on. <laughs> <laughs> so my point is, the accelerator is the working mind. The handbrake is the thinking mind. <laughs> so it is the thinking mind which makes the working mind inefficient. So what bothers this painter, when the working mind is there, he's fine. But when he is not painting, it is the thinking mind which makes him miserable. Well, the time is up. There are three or four more. I, what I will do is, I will give these to Wayne. And Wayne can, for the next talk, and now I think we, have, we are going to have some bhajan, aren't we? Please.